All righty. Hi, everybody. Thanks for taking the time to join today. We'll just give a minute or two for everybody who is interested to join in on the webinar. Thanks for joining during many of your lunch hours today. I look forward to sharing some insights with you. All right, and with that, we can get started. So thanks again, everybody, for taking the time to join today. My name is Kobe Sconard. I'm one of the co-founders and the CEO at IdeaWake, and really, really excited today to have uh, you know some of our some of our really good buddies that have been you know working through innovation. Uh, we've had the opportunity to do great work with them, um, and really, what they're going to be talking about today is empowering women entrepreneurs in healthcare. Uh, and can you go to the next slide for me? Thank you. Just like a really quick background on us, and, and I'm going to give um, Darcy and Emily the floor right after this, but just a little bit of background on what we do. So IdeaWake is a software platform that helps uh, really, in short, transform employee ideas into impact. Uh, it's a platform that's end-to-end -end innovation management uh, and really supports and enabling a culture of innovation at scale across larger companies. Uh, and next slide. Thanks, Emily. Uh, we're doing this in 39 countries, over 185 cities, uh, just uh, really in actually now 13, I think, different verticals. It's really crazy, um, you know, what employees at front lines of companies are capable of doing uh, and really looking forward once again to hearing more about that in the words of women entrepreneurs themselves. So with that, I'm going to hand over the reins to Darcy and Emily. Thank you so much for taking the time to join today. Thank you, Kobe. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. We're um, thrilled to, uh, to join you and happy to support the IdeaWake team. Um, I'm Darcy Lorenzone. I um, worked on an innovation program project um, opportunity with two colleagues and friends, uh, Emily Connors and Jennifer Livermore. And unfortunately, Jennifer is unable to join us today. We learned that she's ill. So we're sending her our good wishes. So Emily and I will, will take it from here. Um, why don't you move us to the next slide? Okay, we're gonna start by talking with you a little bit about um, innovation program startup and uh, share our story with you, uh, but also give you some insight into lessons learned. We've been in the healthcare space for some time. And um, one of the things that we recognized early on is that almost all of the healthcare systems in the Milwaukee market have some form of an innovation program. And those programs um, are very different in how they are, um, how they were created and also how they exist today. So many healthcare systems uh, started with sort of a ground up approach to innovation, um, focused on frontline innovation. So really focused on employees and employees suggestions for change and ideas to share. Uh, and then there are other organizations that chose to create an innovation um, department or a program uh, that ran alongside the rest of the healthcare system, but was um, legally separated and had the freedom to create new products, new services um, on their own. And then somewhat of a blend of the two. So uh, a lot of uh, organizations that are in place today have also set aside funding where they um, invest in other small startup organizations outside of their walls um, that can provide a service or a program that helps differentiate them in the market. Um, the system that we were part of um, actually did the ground up kind of an approach and we partnered with IdeaWake um, during that process. That's how we became connected to them. So in terms of vision, um, our, some of our early learnings, and then again, looking back now that we know was absolutely true. It's really important if you're someone who's trying to start a new program like this in your system or your organization, that you have a good feel for how ready the organization is to do this work. 
Um, and in addition to that, you have some sense of what the infrastructure will be uh, that's required to actually stand up and support an innovation program. And most importantly, uh, whether or not you have a culture of innovation um, in existence today, or you have the knowledge and the skill set uh, to create one, because it's, um, it's an important element to your program's overall success. In terms of readiness, um, some of the things that we learned right away is um, it, it's important to engage different departments, different leaders at different levels of the organization to interview them and understand where they are, um, what their perspective is about where the organization is in terms of its readiness toward innovation. It's also a great way to find people who have a general sense of curiosity and interest in innovation are motivated toward doing things uh, in a unique or interesting way. Maybe they have a side hustle or they're been, they've been part of a, a small company or a startup because those are the people who um, are the ones you want to surround yourself with. The other thing that I think is critical is um, how well are the senior leaders in the organization um, listening, talking with, hearing, and observing what's going on inside the organization with regard to how easy or how difficult um, it is for patients to access um, care or to access your services or to even know about them. <clears throat> and I think it's very important to consider whether or not innovation can give you a competitive distinction or a differentiation. Um, now, because most, health, most healthcare systems have figured out that innovation is a really important element to their business, it might not be such a big differentiator, but how you go about it and what you do with it definitely will be. And I think the other thing that's important in readiness is whether or not you've had any success in the past at creating new programs, new services, new products, uh, that you know um, meet the needs of the patient or the consumer or customer that you're trying to target. That helps a great deal when you're trying to stand up a new program. And the most important thing um, after you've uh, secured this level of support is making sure that there is funding set aside um, to help with new ideas because otherwise uh, employees can get very um, disinterested quickly if there's no incentive around all of this. Mm -hmm. In terms of vision, um, <clears throat> I think it's important to know that um, vision can come from all different parts of the organization. It doesn't necessarily come from the top. Uh, we had a vision for how innovation should look, but the important element to all of this from the beginning was to share that vision with the CEO and make sure that the CEO shared it. Um, that they believed in it as much as we did, um, that they saw the value of it. And there's a difference between commitment um, and attention um, toward it and, and often um, the level of investment that's um, available or made available to the program. Uh, we had we enjoyed the support of the CEO um, where we were trying to stand up this innovation program um, and, there, and also the support of, of many in the senior leadership team. I think that support changes over time based on how successful you are with the program, which is why it's so critically important to have strong partners who work in the innovation space and can guide and direct you. And that's what we had with Kobe and his team in Ideal Wake. So in terms of infrastructure, uh, it is all about having the right people at the table at the right time and um, having the right tools. We learned very quickly that um, there's never a shortage of ideas that can come from employees if you ask them the question. They'll be happy to share your, their ideas with you. But when they share those ideas, there is certainly an expectation that they're going to hear something about those ideas, that something's going to happen with them. And that's where the um, impact of an idea management system, um, the right tools, to manage all of that is critical. If you don't have the right tools, uh, it's gonna very quickly um, fall apart 
and I say that because if you're fortunate enough to have people um, invested and interested in the program and they submit their ideas, but they come to your, your department or the group of people that are supposed to be handling the innovation program, they've got to be able to manage all of that. Um, you'll learn a bit later in this discussion um, the number of ideas that came through um, our first challenge that we put out to our employees um, was quite significant. And had we not had the idea management system um, and understand how it worked in the support of Kobe and his team and with the IT team on the organizational side, it would have been very difficult to make it work um, well. So I think it's important to have that. And with the infrastructure, um, I think the critical element is, um, again, finding the right leader to launch the program. You have to have someone who's very um, passionate about innovation, who is eager and willing to listen and learn and continue to listen and learn over time. Uh, it's very important to um, make sure that you've aligned yourself with others in the organization who have similar characteristics and to bring them together. Uh, one of the things that worked incredibly well for us, um, we identified 42 different champions um, from all levels of the organization, but who shared similar characteristics specific to innovate, uh, innovative mindset. And we reached out to their bosses and asked for their permission to engage uh, the people on their team that we had identified and to create a champions network so that innovation could be cross, uh, could cross over all the layers of the organization and across the entire healthcare system because we were rolling this out to the entire system all at the same time. I think it's important to know how to build a strong business case around the idea of innovation and an innovation program and to know what uh, kind of money um, can be and should be set aside to make it successful. It's not a huge amount of money, but you have to have some kind of funding set aside for those ideas that filter to the top and have great um, potential. And then I think it's really important to, um, to make sure that you have a really good plan and hope is not a plan. <laughs> Uh, it's important to have a strong partner in uh, with good project management skills who can help you bring this um, plan forward and also helps to ensure that it's synced with budgeting as well as funding um, going going forward. That's what will sustain it over time. In terms of culture, um, we depended significantly on those 42 champions to help set the stage for improving the culture. And it, it was very important as well. Um, we did not have a background uh, in innovation when we started the program. We, we knew some people in the organization knew more than others. So we had a very steep learning curve. And one of the things we figured out pretty quickly is that um, <clears throat> not to be too myopic in your thinking around this, it's important to reach out to others in other industries who have deep um, understanding and experience in innovation in order to learn from them. So one of the first things we did that was a really important um, step for us and, and helped the program be successful, we began to interview and learn about people in the Milwaukee region who had a long history with innovation. And that's how we met Idea Wake. It's also how we met a number of leaders in other organizations who we then recruited to create an innovation council. And we used that council as advisors to help us with the program um, development as well as the ongoing um, connections to other innovators and to other innovation um, other innovation um, opportunities that were in the region that we wanted to take advantage of, including working with other um, educational institutions like Concordia University, um, the UW Lubar um, Entrepreneurship Center, for example, um, and even uh, the Marquette um, Pro Innovation Program. So I think it's really important to have a good team of advisors by your side. 
I think it's also really critical in creating a culture that you select the right challenges to go after and not um, muddy the waters with multiple challenges at the same time. Some organizations, if they have significant bench strength, can do this well. Other organizations, not so much. For us, we chose one challenge that we knew based on data and um, analysis that we were facing that we needed ideas around how to address. And that proved to be a very successful strategy for us. And I think um, in the Additionally, it's really important to have a very strong communication plan to talk about innovation on a regular basis, to share the results, to share the quick wins, to um, praise people in their efforts, because this is a new, um, often it's a new skill set that you're trying um, to embed in your culture. And it's also, it takes a lot of courage and a lot of bravery to do something new and go against the grain sometimes. So it's very important to encourage people along the way. And those are the elements that we felt made a great sense in trying to create a good culture and then continue to repeat it and refine it as you go forward. And now I'll turn it over to Emily. She's my partner in crime. Emily was the person who um, helped to put the framework in place, put all the pieces together, um, helped to integrate the idea, wake, um, idea management system and the partnership with Kobe and his team. And she's gonna talk more about um, the reality of what we, came, uh, what we came up with as a result of the innovation program. So Emily, I'll turn it over to you. Great, thanks Darcy. And as Darcy said, I'll, I'll give you a kind of a glimpse into some of the details and expound on, on some of what Darcy just shared um, with our experience. So think of it as a, a little case study on our um, community healthcare system as we launch the innovation program. So as Darcy said, we had some stumbled upon some data out of our strategy office uh, and some analytics um, that really led us to our first challenge. And we partnered with IdeaWake uh, to launch our first challenge um, with the platform. And that was how can we engage younger healthcare consumers? And um, this was the challenge we posed to over uh, 4,000, about 4,500 employees um, to really get their ideas, uh, hear their thoughts, uh, and provided them with some context and data along uh, the way as part of our communication process. This was the overall process um, we developed and, and deployed as we, we moved along. And I'll elaborate on each one of these phases here as we move through our experience, starting with idea, Ideate with that challenge. So we launched that challenge with heavy communication and engagement plan to uh, allow employees to submit their ideas through the platform um, for a short period of time, um, then closed in that uh, ideation session and allowed folks um, to really vote and comment on the ideas. This was all very transparent um, via the platform and allowed employees to access it at any time uh, via their work computer or phone um, or tablet and, and see the ideas that were coming in response to the challenge. Uh, there, as Darcy indicated, we had our network of champions, and from our, our network of champions, we identified some subject matter experts to really help us evaluate those ideas that came in that first challenge. And so the, the platform was really key in helping us manage and funnel all of those ideas off to our subject matter experts in our champion network and allow them to rate those ideas so we could funnel down. We received um, just about 400 ideas through the platform and about 40% uh, of our workforce participated uh, in that challenge. And we received a number of comments on those ideas that expounded on the, the ideas submitted, um, elaborated on them, or just cheered them on as part of a, a great idea. And we had almost 4,000 votes placed uh, on those ideas. So overall, we were just pleased with these statistics uh, for our first challenge um, out to the broader organization and felt it was very well received. Uh, of that, 
our SMEs, our subject matter experts evaluated those ideas and we whittled it down um, to a smaller number of ideas and then allowed our innovation council to also evaluate those ideas through the idea management platform and came together um, really more in a discussion and a dialogue um, and whittled it down to eight ideas across five broad categories that um, some aligned with our overall strategic plan or just trends, broader trends within healthcare that we thought would be a good fit to explore. So we worked hard to identify um, team members and develop teams around each of these eight ideas. And uh, as Darcy indicated earlier, we um, felt it important that there were varying levels of employees across the system, all levels. So we had directors, VPs, um, all the way through to frontline nurse clinical staff um, on these teams. Um, we did have um, throughout the duration, right, of the, the program need to supplement teams or add others um, so that the teams could ebb and flow based on expertise or where the ideas went. From um, these eight ideas, the teams um, in partnership with Idea, Idea Wake really went through an accelerator uh, innovation boot camp to further uh, develop the ideas that came in. Um, this was ten, a 10 week work effort. And at the end of the 10 weeks, the teams pitched their ideas uh, to the innovation council and they voted on um, ideas to move forward through um, another part uh, of our process, which was the incubate uh, process. Each phase was really kind of a stop gate. So we would stop, kind of assess, reflect, learn, where do we want to go from here? Um, and had that as a full discussion with those involved in the innovation program. From there, um, our two ideas um, went through another eight week uh, incubation phase. And here they, the two teams that were selected really spent amount of time further validating those ideas and assumptions that sat behind um, those ideas. They also um, worked hard to develop prototypes for those ideas and what those prototypes would look like um, before moving into a, a pilot phase. So the two ideas um, that were selected um, to move forward of the eight were creating a price transparency tool for consumers and then offering evening appointments with primary care physicians. So two teams spent um, an additional eight weeks further developing these ideas, conducting interviews um, and research um, around these ideas. Uh, I'll share what Jennifer um, was going to share. We'll, we'll give a deeper dive into the price transparency uh, prototype and team effort here. And Jennifer was part of that team, just to give you a little glimpse of, of how this played out. So the problem that um, this team um, of a, was about three to five individuals um, were looking to tackle was patients burdened by the costs and lack of transparency within healthcare. So they discovered through their early interviews uh, and consumer research um, through that first um, accelerate phase of the program that this problem existed regardless of, of demographics. So it wasn't just a younger healthcare consumer problem. Uh, many people have high deductible plans. That's much more common now than it has been previously. And surprise billing and charges um, were quite common. And then of course, all within the context of a broader uh, regulatory change from a policy level. They sought to develop a solution for an online price estimation tool that would really be easily um, understood for procedures, customized for the patient's or consumer's specific insurance and deductible wherever it may be at a given time, so that they could make accurate and informed decisions uh, around what service to get with um, uh, within their um, healthcare experience, and that it be accessible 24 seven online, whenever um, the consumer would want to access that information. The team, um, based on again, on their interviews um, from consumers, um, 
sought to develop a prototype that was friendly and really a tailored user interface. So you're seeing a glimpse of the, the first prototype uh, that they pulled together and the information that it would collect as, as part of um, that prototype. It wasn't live, they didn't actually collect any real information, but it was clickable and the consumer or the person being interviewed could interact with that prototype as if it were an online um, live website. They um, presented the consumer trying to test different assumptions on, for example, would they be comfortable with a range uh, in an estimate? How much information would the consumer really wanna enter into this online tool? And what else would they want? Um, so they made enhancements as they continued their interviews and consumer insights um, throughout their eight weeks in this phase. Uh, once they heard things like, oh, I'd want to text the, I want, I would want this quote texted to me. Uh, they hadn't thought about that. It wasn't built into the prototype. So throughout they added the text option as well as the email information. So they, they ended up conducting over 47 consumer interviews. Um, they were able to do observations um, internally via our um, billing department where they were getting estimates, uh, calls in for estimates, which was the current state of things for um, prices for certain procedures. And then they were able to show the pop-up test, which was the prototype actually went out to both current patients, but then just others out in the street um, the prototype and get uh, responses from 81 individuals. You'll see the breakdown here, about 60% were patients of the health system and 40% and, uh, were not. <clears throat> so their primary hypotheses that were driving their, their testing was, will people use an estimator tool and will having a price estimator attract younger health consumers? Based on their interviews and consumer insight testing, um, they found that 86% would use the estimator tool and that 52% of the younger age cohorts that they spoke to would actually switch healthcare providers because they would know the price of a service before getting that. So they, they, they felt pretty good about that. Other interesting things that they learned along the way through their interviews, um, which we had learned as well through some of the secondary research that the team conducted, was that um, price shopping was becoming more common in healthcare, and this was true as well with the folks that they interviewed. Um, most were comfortable with a price range, which was something else they were trying to test and get a pulse on. And many, again, almost 70% almost did not want to call to get a price estimate, which was the current state, not only for the health system we were at, but also for others within the market. And that self-pay and cash discounts were an area um, of growing interest for consumers um, and wanting to know what prices would be if, if they paid cash. Uh, and then still lots of confusion around healthcare, um, the folks not being comfortable looking at what they might need for the service or wanting to talk to their doctor first. And convenience and automation was definitely um, brought up through the interviews as they did their pop-up tests. And even uh, prior to that, people did not want to have to enter in information over and over again. They wanted automation. If you have my insurance information, please pull it in so that I can have accurate information on my estimate. So just some direct quotes. I won't read these, but um, we heard um, from many that were on the cusp of getting off of their um, maybe parents insurance. So I'll be 26 and I'm going to be responsible now for my medical bills. Pretty big milestone within um, this person's life. So they would want to know how much a service was so that they could budget appropriately. That was pretty common. And again, a texting feature, anything to make it a little more convenient on your, on your phone was the way to go. So we were in the middle of all of this prototyping and we're just about ready um, to move into the next phase and COVID hit. And that really threw a wrench in things. So here, Darcy, I'll kind of turn it over to you. To, can we can elaborate on where things are now um, and, and where things have fallen with this specific project? Thanks, Emily. <clears throat> yeah, it's, a, it's an appropriate um, visual for COVID for sure. Um, and thankfully, uh, thankfully, we're, we're a year post uh, COVID and ha have the, uh, the view and the advantage of uh, vaccine in front of us, which is wonderful. But um, 
the team in, at the community healthcare system, and this is the part where I think Jennifer would have been able to share a really good insight. Um, can you flip to the next? Um, they, <clears throat> they worked um, really, really diligently on advancing the pricing prototype quickly. And in part, that was because there was also um, federal regulation around healthcare systems providing um, uh, pricing, um, uh, pricing transparency to consumers around, you know, major um, services, so that there was a, a lot more um, clarity around what insurance um, may or may not cover, and we could avoid so much of the shock of of uh, for patients um, coming up with um, money to pay for for procedures that they had no idea was going to cost as much as they did. So that helped that helped spur the continued development of the prototype. One of the things that um, I think is true in healthcare in general, but definitely was true in this case, um, the electronic health record plays such an incredibly uh, important role inside healthcare systems today that if there isn't a way to connect all of this to the health record, it becomes extremely problematic. Um, interestingly enough, uh, as, as the teams were developing the prototype and doing the testing, the electronic health record um, vendors were also trying to swiftly move something into place um, to offer their customers, of which there are thousands. Um, but as we looked at what the electronic health record vendor uh, was suggesting uh, would be adequate for pricing transparency, it differed pretty significantly from what the consumers were telling us they um, wanted and needed. And so there becomes a bit of a rift in terms of um, how does the organization make good decisions about moving forward with that? And where is there common ground that can um, actually uh, help with these kinds of conversations? Um, it also takes, I think, a, a really significantly strong leader um, and someone who is continues to carry the flag of the, of the patient and the, cu the customer forward and say, the closer we can get to providing what they tell us they need, the better product we have, the better service we offer. And in the end, that's what we all want. So the voice um, uh, in this case was Jennifer Livermore and her team and making sure that as the electronic health record folks continue to bring forward what the device or what the system itself might offer, she continued to push back with her and her team to say, no, we can do better. And together they worked out um, an approach that would work that is, that is on their consumer facing system today. They launched the price estimate um, for common services. And when we say common, I think the list actually was 300. <laughs> Correct, yeah. Oh, Darcy, we can't hear you. Oh no, Darcy, I think Dar you're um, Darcy. Uh, she's, she lost her. Uh, oh. oh, Darcy. Yes. Oh, we couldn't yeah. hear you. It must've been oh. your connection. I'm sorry. Yeah, it might have been a, a message coming through. Uh, so the uh, the um, conclusion of the prototype into regular production and use took about five months of additional work, uh, which frankly, cons considering the impact of it and the number of people that were involved is pretty darn fast. Um, on, on top of the COVID pressures. On top of well. COVID. Yeah, mm -hmm. so it's nothing short of miraculous, to be honest. Um, there was a significant amount of internal education and training that had to happen. As you might imagine, there are a number of people that intersect with patients who are asking about costing and pricing um, issues. So it's a significant undertaking um, from an education and training perspective. And then um, continuing to um, listen to what customers tell us after the fact so that the product can continue to be refined 
uh, which is, of course, the iteration work that happens in innovation, uh, or at least should be happening in innovation today. So I think overall, um, we would we would all line up uh, to say that this was a very successful approach uh, for us and for the organization. It was an incredibly gratifying um, experience for almost all of us, despite the amount of work that it took to do it. Um, and uh, the organization is better for it. I can say that for sure, because the product that they brought across the finish line is indeed what um, in line with what the customer tell, uh, tells them that they want and they need. So um, I think that's, that concludes our portion of the conversation today, but we're happy to um, engage any questions anyone might have from the audience. That was nothing short of amazing. So thank you so much for doing that. Um, genuinely, I'll turn my camera back on now because I didn't want my face to be showing up while you were talking in the like, playback of this. So I'm back. Uh, but Carter, uh, I think is going to help us field a couple questions uh, if um, if there are any, and I actually have a couple, of course, as well. Okay. Fire away. Mm -hmm. So I think Carter had a question about the challenges. Yeah. Um, so I'm just curious, you know, like what are some of the challenges, you know, um, you faced in kind of getting that initial senior leadership support um, for you know innovation if any. Yes, there were. Um, and it, it took several weeks and frankly months of um, consistent revisions of what a framework might look like, um, multiple conversations and assurances about um, what it would be and what it would take to lift it off the ground. And, <clears throat> and also I, I will say that um, having conversations with other people that can influence the CEO positively is also a really effective strategy. So I didn't want it to only be my voice approaching the CEO to encourage her to consider this idea. I also wanted her own peers um, and senior executive um, leaders to be able to weigh in and offer their input. So, we made sure to make time with those folks as well and talk with them about the vision for it, the innovation program and allowed their curiosity and their interest um, to carry that message forward to the CEO as well. That, that was an effective strategy for us. I think the other thing that actually can be extraordinarily helpful is learning from other people outside of healthcare about how innovation works in other industries. Um, and I think that actually served us well in terms of <clears throat> as we introduced those people into our organization, it was interesting to watch how senior leaders in particular uh, gravitated toward them to ask questions about their experience. And that helped build um, <clears throat> an understanding about what innovation is and what it looks like in other organizations. And that despite the changes across industries, the approach and the methodology can be um, pretty significantly similar. Um, <clears throat> and we learned very effectively from others how to engage, how to endorse or how to try things that they tried in their industry um, and see if it would work in healthcare. And indeed, most of the time it did. Yeah, that's excellent. I mean, you know, and, and Kobe can kind of speak to this as well, but, you know, what we've seen is that, um, you know, regardless of the industry, people really respond to success stories and just seeing how others, you know, go about innovation, kind of, you know, what they can accomplish by, you know, hearing out employees and what have you. So it doesn't always have to be, you know, industry specific, um, you know, insights. You can always kind of trans, you know, transfer some of that, um, you know, some of those strategies, some of those insights um, to your industry as well. So um, I think that that's a really interesting kind of uh, strategy that seemed proved pretty effective for you. Yeah, and that, that cross industry innovation, what you can learn by basically applying things from other industries to yours, right? Um, something that is interesting though, uh, is for, for healthcare specifically, right? When you look at the healthcare space, I like to, the analogy I like to you know use is you have a lot of cooks in the kitchen, right? So that's like an interesting um, 
and it is unique, like and you see it in legal actually as well, where some of the incentive structures are like themselves like different than you're going to see in other industries like manufacturing. Uh, mm -hmm. Would love to like hear, I mean, if you have any insight on that, just I know it's something that everybody we hear everybody running innovation programs and in healthcare runs into. If you had any insight on like how you went about addressing that or just, you know, like lessons learned, I guess, about addressing like how you go about going to the different folks and like it could be service line, you've seen your leadership, you have docs, right? Trying to like attack those different vectors in order to get things done. You know, Kobe, for, for me, it, it really started more from a strategic view of what characteristics was I looking for in partners inside the organization? And I was looking specifically for people that had had a certain approach to learning and trying new things and being open to new things and who was known to have a reputation for dabbling in other areas. And um, that was my first line of defense. I, I really felt that um, if I surround myself with people who behave in that way and have those similar interests, and continue to explore innovation from that perspective, it, will, it would serve us well. And that was very effective. I will say though, that um, the advice and the insight that we gained from um, engaging others outside of healthcare in the Milwaukee region who were known um, experts in innovation um, was critical to our success. Uh, we didn't know what we didn't know. And until we began to um, engage with them and learn and listen, ask questions, we attended um, many events uh, locally, um, startup events, um, became uh, members of Startup Milwaukee, um, started to uh, attend um, pitch events and things like that to learn as much as we could as fast as we could. Mm -hmm. That actually helped us provide guidance and stewardship inside the healthcare system as well. And I think that that was uh, an essential critical success factor for us. Definitely. I mean, that makes perfect sense. And, and kind of to your point too, the other thing that I really gleaned out of there uh, was that, you know, you don't need to try to take over the world all at once. Right, so the partnerships that you were trying to build out in the beginning, health systems are complex and they're very large. So a lot of the times it seems overwhelming, right? Where you go first. And I think that what you said, Dars, like really pointing out who are the people that are going to think differently and be the early adopters and really targeting projects around those folks uh, can be really helpful on taking a daunting task and making it a lot more manageable. Yeah, I think you hit the nail on the head. It's about identifying those people that can get some easy wins and build momentum for your program. And I think that's how we, that was our strategy is to find those people, identify those projects and try and get them across the finish line, keeping the consumer insights and needs and wants right at the center of that. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Um, those proverbial quick wins, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Um, <laughs> what other questions do we have? Carter, are there any other questions that we have coming in? I uh, don't see any at the moment. Okay. I can ask, uh, let's see. I've got, I could ask you questions for the next three hours probably. Uh, <laughs> but I would say like, you know, looking back now, right after COVID and the program, um, you know, itself and just having time to like think about lessons learned, what would you say some of the biggest, like biggest things, like biggest takeaways or like lessons learned that you had from running the program? Emily, why don't you go first? <laughs> Thanks, Dar. <laughs> um, That's really hard questions. I'm sorry. No, I, I think it's a good, I mean, we learn, you have to be open to learning throughout the entire process and I, and making time for that reflection, uh, especially when you're building something new that's different within a, a larger structure that healthcare is where there's competing priorities and um, that can get in the way of, of moving some of these ideas and projects across the finish line. So um, I think that's, that's key, right? Is to have that reflection and learning built in so that you can pivot or adjust um, as you need to. 
Um, and I think, you know, keeping the consumer um, at the center um, around these ideas and listening to what the consumer or the patient or the individual has to say around any given idea. That was, I, I remember when we did, we paused with our eight teams, you know, of 30 some people and at the end and said, you know, how was this for you? What were some of your takeaways? And we had a, a pretty, um, you know, influential leader in the room say, this completely opened my eyes, um, talking with consumers, going out and having to talk with people about this idea, which had to do around IT, we need this in our process. We're clearly missing something. And that was like, wow, yes. Yeah, so, okay, we, we caught someone, right, on the value of, of doing things differently than the way they've always been done um, in healthcare. And so, um, keeping a, a way in which you're getting that consumer input and voice in on ideas that you're, you're moving forward, I think is key. That's like, just really quickly to go off that, right? Cause that was one of the coolest insights that I'm like, one of the coolest things that I've seen in running these is that, right. Uh, to go dive a little bit deeper into what you just said, Emily, it was basically it, the learnings that you take from the program and apply back to your everyday work life. And applying like IT, making sure that like one of the forms, right, on IT yes. submissions had like how have you validated this with the customer? Who is the customer for this? And how have you validated it? Like that's really the output of these programs and how you build that culture. It was like an exhibit A, like the perfect exhibit, especially within healthcare, of yeah. how these programs can produce results to change culture over time. Mm -hmm. Sorry, Darcy. No, I, I was just thinking that as Emily was describing that, how often we heard um, people that were working on these, um, these ideas um, in the teams, there, were, there was some grousing about um, interviewing um, yes. customers, and, uh, what, which was so startling to us because every healthcare system in the country will tell you that they are patient focused. Um, but when it comes to designing the service, uh, what we found was it's quite the opposite, that often we're, um, it stems more from um, a bit more of a paternalistic view of we know what you should need and have, we are the healthcare experts, but the reality is quite different. Um, that is true, they are the healthcare experts, but in providing the service or the product or the program, whatever it might be, in a way that makes sense to the consumer, the only way you learn if you're hitting the mark or not is through interviews, observation, research. And if you're unwilling to do that, then it's gonna be problematic for you. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a lot of, um, it takes some courage to, you know, step out um, and talk to a complete stranger about something. But I think once you get the hang of it, and you get more comfortable with it, the easier it becomes. And it's astonishing to me, how quickly patients and consumers in general will tell you exactly the information you're seeking, if you just bother to ask it. Um, so it's quite the opposite experience of someone saying no to you. Um, it's more of, I'll tell you exactly what I think. Um, you might not like it, <laughs> but, you, but you do want to hear about it. Um, one, of the, one of the drivers of the pricing transparency tool that became, was just a light bulb moment for us, it they talked about having a chat feature so that if I want to talk to somebody right now about this, can I do that? Mm -hmm. And then most astonishing was the, um, the question about, well, why can't, let me just schedule then. Yes. <laughs> if I know what it is and I know what it costs and I have insurance and your tool tells me how much my deductible has paid and what it, my estimated cost is, and I'm okay with that, I want to schedule it. So the connection to scheduling and actually getting the patient in the door was, um, it seems like it would have been so apparent to us, but I tell you it was not. And it wasn't until the consumer told us that, that we went, oh yeah, okay, yeah. <laughs> we can do that. <laughs> so I think there's, there's always learning as you go. Um, you just really have to be open to it and willing to listen along the way and not miss it. Yes. Yeah. 
makes perfect sense. Um, well, any other like closing remarks or points, ladies, that you'd like to get across to the group? I would just say that um, partnership is everything. So be thoughtful when you're considering who to partner with. That includes um, choosing the, um, the partner that can help you manage the ideas and the process and the training of your, of your staff and your team. And for us, um, we were, were and are eternally grateful to have found Kobe and his team and the work that they did with us um, and the ease with which they brought us through it. Um, I, I can't tell you how nervous it is, uh, nerve wracking it can be as a leader who's gone to the CEO to promise, you know, the, the idea of innovation as um, a, a really a great opportunity to differentiate your organization, um, to have it fall apart because you don't have a good system to um, manage all those ideas as they come through and you don't have a defined process and education around how to train teams to do the work. So for us, um, we were just incredibly lucky to have found uh, such a great uh, partnership in Kobe and his team and to have them local, to have them work with us elbow to elbow. We learned a great deal on both ends of that spectrum for them and for us. And um, it's just important that you have a really good partner. And the other thing I would say is that it's also really important on the inside of your, of your organization that you have a team of people you can surround yourself with who continue to build you up as you do this work because it can be daunting. And um, there are a lot of people inside the organization who might not understand it and not support it. So it's important that you surround yourself with people, colleagues, friends who actually do get it and do support you and lean into them when you need to because um, this is not a sprint, <laughs> this is a marathon. And if you're looking for a long-term solution in innovation, you have to be willing to stick with it long enough for that to happen. So those would be my two parting comments. Emily, what about you? I, I agree with you completely, Darcy. I think um, partnerships, especially given our organization's size and, and setup were really key for, for us um, and, and being open and, and listening and pivoting when you need to. I think um, having those people around you internally um, for that support, support and validation are just um, really key and critical um, when you're building up a program. Completely agree, and thank you so much for the kind words. And uh, more, more credit to to our team versus me. Um, I just get to talk to you, lovely ladies, on the phone on, on the webinar today, and be the, the <laughs> facilitator of things. But yeah, I mean, it's really can't say enough about our team and just really the support they provide behind the program. Um, but Agreed. yeah, with that, thank you so much again for taking the time to do this, ladies. Really appreciate it. Know that uh, the audience is going to really find value in this. Um, we'll be sharing this with everybody that joined the session today. Then also mm -hmm. we will be definitely putting this on our website and cutting this up into a couple of different sections uh, based on the topics that were covered. So with that, I think we can close out. And thank you again, everybody else that joined in today. And, uh, you know, happy innovating. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.